Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 3rd of September. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, Australia, the bankster's paradise and what a real economic recovery should look like. Now, before we begin, just to remind people to help us get this information out widely, please like the show, share it. Uh, so if you haven't already, subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and the bell icon so you can get notified when new um, material is put up there on YouTube. And if you want more information about the specific things we talk about, just click on the I in the right-hand corner of the screen above Craig's head. Um, Craig, a couple of quick updates before yep. we start. First of all, the next this is Friday morning the 3rd. Next Friday the 10th is the deadline for submissions to the manufacturing inquiry that we've been talking about for the last month or so, right? This is very important. Make sure we want everyone to put in a submission. There's lots of, we've attracted lots of qualified people from the industry. They're gonna make um, submissions that are, that are very technical and qualified, etc. But we want, this is a political question where the public has to demand a manufacturing sector. And as we, as we said, demand a national development bank to go with that, right? Yeah. And we'll talk about that um, more in the, in the program. So please, even if it's just an email to the inquiry, the, we'll have the link below, um, so, you know, in, in, impress upon them, we need manufacturing, we need a national development bank that can provide the seed, cap, seed capital to make it happen. Second, Craig, um, I'll let you talk about this. The AEC has changed the rules, or the two major parties have changed the rules, for party registration, yeah, what's that mean stop, for us? They want to stop smaller parties, Robbie, or non-parliamentary parties from actually being able to contest elections and get electoral funding and all that stuff. They've changed the rules. To be a party like ours, to be a federally registered party, you have to have 500 members. They've decided, you know, quickly, that's now 1,500 members, right? And the thing is, people don't realise, is it's parties like ours that have to have the membership submitted to the AEC, not the parties that are already in parliament. Yeah. There's 14 parliamentary parties that if you've got a member of parliament, you don't have to worry about these rules. So Clive and Palmer, whose party, sorry Clive, is just a cardboard shell, it's a yes. Potemkin village, he's got a lot of money, he doesn't have a proper party, so he's basically just recruited Craig Kelly That's right. to join his party and that registers him. That's right. But a real grassroots party has to go through a much more 40, process. 40 like us so that have got a membership that are registered. Now, all of a sudden, the government's passed this legislation with the complicity of the Labor Party, because it serves their purposes yeah, of too, course. to shut us out. Now, think about that, Robbie, from what we've been talking about on this show. We you know, were the first in 2013 to raise the, the bail-in threat, and we've defeated that. We're waiting on legislation to go through to really clarify that, but that's in the process. Cash ban. Look what we've talked about, the cash ban. Right? We talked about Christine Holgate. Look what we did as an organisation and created a Senate inquiry on that, and now we're talking about the whole... Postal Ast bank, the postal bank, uh, and national banking. So we created a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of t turmoil in the minds of a lot of these politicians. So let's get rid of them. Let's increase the membership. Now that's not going to affect us, but we do have to, and we will be contacting all our members to clarify and make sure all their data is up, to, their details are up yep. to date, because within three months we might have to make a submission to the Electoral Commission. I mean, the Electoral Commission doesn't even know how this new legislation is going to work. It hasn't even been given royal assent yet. But as with most things, Robbie, we get off the blocks real quick. Yeah. So we it's a logistical wait. challenge, but we will rise to it. That's right. Yeah. And, and I mean, this, is, uh, this means that we will be in touch with our members one way or the other, email, telephone calls, whatever. We'll nail this thing shut as quickly as we can. In, so people should expect to, you know, that sort of... In our latest thing. Australian Alert Service magazine, Craig, we called it Pulling Up the Drawbridge. Yeah. So the, the two major parties are like the, the, uh, the Lords of the Castle, the, 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 the growing anti-major party vote, they're the barbarians at the gate. And what do they do? Do they look at the barbarians and say, oh, we better, the, for the, some reason they're angry at us, we better do something to change ourselves. No, 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 they just pull up the drawbridge yep. <laughs> so they can't come in. And we love a fight, Robbie, as people know. You know, 15 years ago, the ALP admitted it had less members than the Adelaide Crows, and the Adelaide Crows had 40,000 members. And this is a major political party with less members than 40,000 members. That was 15 years ago. Yeah. What do you think it is today if you take out all the branch stacking in Victoria and New exactly. South Wales and the other states? So these, these political parties are trying to protect themselves from our organisation. Right, I mean, that's how we view it. Well, it is. So we're going to rise to that challenge. And if you're a Citizens Party member, expect to get contacted by us to make sure you get your paperwork in order so we can we can meet the registration requirements. All right, let's get into the main part of the show, Craig. Yep. Australia, 
the Banksters Paradise. And we're going to play the tune of that um, because we have been living all our life in a banksters paradise, but it's just got worse, um, except for, for our YouTube copyright reasons, we better not. Um, but I think people get the reference. Uh, there, there's some, we touched on this a little bit last week. Um, we're going to go there again, uh, talking about what Josh Frydenberg's done to, to uh, ASIC and why an inquiry is important. But I just want to just want to update on what we did last this last week, Craig, because it's Friday. So we've spent the week bombarding Parliament with phone calls, the Senators in Parliament demanding an inquiry into ASIC and into Sterling first, right? Now, um, uh, Parliament is, because of COVID restrictions, etc. there were fewer people there and, and the normal dynamic um, of, of how an inquiry might get up wasn't able to happen very quickly. But nevertheless, we have put this issue firmly on the agenda. And I was involved in a Zoom call last Saturday with a bunch of victims of Sterling First, um, mainly based in Western Australia, and they got very fired up, and some of them called all 72 senators themselves, right? It was quite extraordinary. Um, uh, Choice, the consumer advocacy, advocacy group, has got involved, and they've put up a, um, a petition and, and a video on their website and an article talking about the need for compensation for these victims, which is very important. Uh, and, and there is movement in the parliament to beef up the, what's called the compensation scheme of last resort so that victims don't fall between the cracks. So, so those things will, will happen in coming months, um, although there will certainly be fights over them in coming, coming months. Um, and in terms of this specific campaign, I wanted to report now or, or, or uh, publicise now that on Wednesday this coming week, which is the 8th of September, if you're a West Australian viewer, Please listen and take this seriously. Go to par the State Parliament at 11am to support a protest rally by Sterling First victims about ASIC. Right? Please, please, even if you can only go for 10 or 15 minutes, please go. Um, we want to really make a, a big splash with this protest rally, get the media there, etc. There's a, there's a role that the, the Western Australian State Parliament can play because it was a West Australian department, the Department of Commerce, that put in one of the complaints to ASIC that ASIC ignored. Mm -hmm. And when a government department is making a complaint that ASIC ignores, then you know how bad ASIC is. So those things are, are, are in the works and that would be, that'll be a, a very important next step for this part of the campaign. But remember, Sterling First is one predicate of why we need to look at this whole system. And I want to, one of the, re the responses we got from the calls this week was from Senator Eric Abetz. Now, he's a liberal in Tassie. And I just want to read what he said in his reply. He said, There is no doubt that the people ripped off by the Sterling First financial collapse have been hard done by, and I will support any measures to see that they get justice slash compensation. Good on you, Eric. Right, go for it, mate. You're in the government. Make sure it happens. And then he added this. However, we've just had a wide-ranging royal commission into the financial sector, and I don't believe there is much to gain by having an inquiry into ASIC, nor will it assist the 140-odd people, 140-odd, I don't want to say they're odd people. I'm sure Eric wasn't saying that either. 140-odd people, unfortunately affected by the shoddy practices engaged in by this company, being Sterling First. So here's the issue, Craig. Why doesn't Eric, a Liberal, want an inquiry into ASIC, right? Forget the, oh, we just had one. The reason we need an inquiry into ASIC is because you're trashing what we've just had in the Royal Commission, right? And that's why we call in this segment, Australia is a bankster's paradise. And as we touched on last week, ASIC is supposed to be the cop of the financial system, mm. right? That's, it's there to, Enforce the law. The independent cop. The independent cop. Robbie. Yeah, that's, that's right. A cop should not be told who to arrest or who not to arrest. That's right. Right? Now, ASIC is already a weak and corrupt agency, right? But Josh Frydenberg, with what he did last week, he has turned ASIC from being the cops of the financial system into the bouncers at the Banksters nightclub. That's their new job now. And I want to read... We covered this in the alert. I just want to read um, two things that are on ASIC's website, Craig, that are completely contradictory, right? So ASIC has this section on its website called Our Role. And I'll just, I'll just highlight, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just highlight some of the things that, that um, it says there. Our role under the ASIC Act 
uh, or it says ASIC is Australia's uh, integrated corporate markets, financial services and consumer credit regulator. ASIC is an independent Australian government body. Independent. Independent, right? yeah. Um, then it cites the Act. Our role under the ASIC Act is to, quote, maintain and facilitate, sorry, maintain, facilitate and improve the performance of the financial system and entities in it, promote confident and informed participation by investors and consumers in the financial system. And, I, and, and the comment we wrote to that in our publication here is this requires participants to know the law is enforced if they want confident participation and informed, right? Because that's what didn't happen in the Sterling First case. ASIC didn't inform the victims that these people, these Sterling First directors had a history a mile long. That's despite direct collaboration with ASIC, asking that question directly, yeah. not just some vague... Yeah, the question to... was, are there any red flags here? And ASIC said no. No, that's the point. Right? Um, administer the law effectively and with minimal procedural requirements. Now... This, we wrote, this should mean enforcement should be effective instead of bureaucratic. It doesn't mean enforcement should be light touch, and that's what it is instead. Um, make information about companies and other bodies available to the public as soon as practical, practicable, and that is exactly what we just talked about. They did not do that for the Sterling First victims. And this is the final thing, essentially. Take whatever action we can and which is necessary to enforce and give effect to the law. That's ASIC's own understanding of its role under legislation. What has just Josh Frydenberger just done under um, this new statement of expectations that he has issued, to not just to guide ASIC, but ASIC will be judged by this new statement of expectations that Josh Frydenberg's just issued. As we, we, we quoted this one last week, the government expects ASIC to identify and pursue opportunities to contribute to the government's economic goals, including supporting Australia's economic recovery from the COVID pandemic. And we comment here, this contradicts ASIC's responsibility to do whatever is necessary to enforce the law. It's not there to help the government grow the economy. It's there to police the lawbreakers. That's its role. Um, uh, uh, Frydenberg says... In doing so, the government expects ASIC to promote the sound functioning of capital markets and the corporate sector for the benefit of business and households. And our comment, this can only be done by enforcing the law. 2.2, minimise the costs and burdens of regulatory requirements for regulated entities and consumers. Not ASIC's responsibility. It's not up to it to say, oh, oh we've got to minimise our law enforcement role here. No, see crime, enforce the law. There's, where's this other crap come into it, right? Um, and, it and it goes on in that vein, the, the actual, the actual, the actual um, statement of expectations is too long, but there's a whole series of those let's, things. Let's there. use a football analogy here, Robbie, because you know, there might be a lot of football fans. You know, what you're saying is the umpire, yes. right, has got to favour one team instead of the other. So if that one team is the banks and the people are the other team, it's saying we're now changed the rules so that you have to play with one side of the football match. In other words, you've got to favour the banks. Because we want the we want the banks to have fun when they're playing football and have fun means winning all the time. Yeah, that's right. And the point is that the people can't even kick a goal because they can't even get near the you know the, their side of the goal post because simply the, the it is so stacked against them. Yep. That's what's happening in the financial system with this sort of regulation. And remember there's a scandal at the heart of this. And I just want to recap it quickly. We've covered it in previous weeks, but after the Royal Commission there was a couple of years where new management at ASIC tried to do the right thing. And that was James Shipton and his chair, Daniel Crennan. And I just and we need a real football match here, in other words. Well, they did. They said, OK, we're going to, these, these are the rules. You're going to abide by the rules. So what did they do? They opposed the Frydenberg-Morrison government's uh, policy to water down responsible lending laws because they knew that lending standards were already rubbish, mm -hmm. right? Why water them down further? There was, a West, there was a decision taken um, uh, uh, by ASIC against Westpac, specifically over its lending. And these were, it was this, this was pre-Royal Commission. This was the lending that had led to a lot of victims, right? And people going bankrupt because they couldn't repay their loans, etc. And that, the judge ruled in the bank's favour there. It was called the Wagyu and Shiraz decision. And the judge says, well, 
of course, everyone should be able to repay their loan if they stop eating Wagyu steak and drinking Shiraz. That's how out of touch this judge was. And Crennan and Shipton appealed that decision. And when they appealed it, they, the, the, the powers that be came down on them. The government, the Treasury, the Reserve Bank all said, don't do that. Right? And they, they, um, they, they demanded they back off. Three, they dropped what these things called enforceable undertakings. Now, enforceable undertakings, Craig, is a way that um, it's, 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 it's the definition of too big to jail. Right? No banker goes to jail in Australia and, and no bank really gets into, into trouble. Instead of taking them to court, ASIC for years and years would, would say, okay, it's like a, think of it as like a, a, a corporate suspended sentence. Mm -hmm. right? We are going to, here's a, here's a token fine and, and, and here's a black mark against your name but you don't have to admit wrongdoing, right? And don't do it again. And they, they, they would pour out dozens and dozens of these a year because the banks are always breaking the rules. And, and, the, gov and the government lets them get away with that, Robbie. Because of course. Of what you're talking about with Frydenberg. But think about what they did with robo-debt and think about how they went after Centrelink payers, right? Because, look, they know that there's a vulnerable, vulnerable population out there that'll just roll over, and they did. And many people, unfortunately, suicided. They, they, they took their life because of the intense pressure that the government allowed Centrelink to do. But, Whereas when you're talking about the banks, it's don't, yeah. don't jail bankers, go soft, and, of course, now they've wrapped up the government. The government is brutal on, on, um, on people. powerless people, Yeah, right? But these are the people who have the real power. So Crennan and Shipton, Shipton and Crennan, sorry, they dropped those enforceable undertakings and they started taking banks to court. And in fact, Daniel Crennan said, and he was, he was the deputy in charge of enforcement under Shipton, he said, the banks should fear us. And there's a headline in the Financial mm -hmm. Review from the time he said that. And you can see that the banks all going, oh my God, that's not supposed to happen, right? <laughs> well, um, the fourth thing they did was uh, they stopped, there was, there'd been this thing where London banks were being allowed to operate in Australia without a license. They could just come in here and we quoted on our show and in the alert service how the city of London, um, some a journalist who was involved in exposing the mafia in Italy, Robert Sa Roberto Saviano, had said the city of London is the most corrupt place in the world, right? And we were letting the banks from there just wander in Australia do what do, do what they like. ASIC, uh, Shipton, and Crennan stopped that, right? They were thrown out last year and this year, same time as Christine Holgate was got rid of. They they, they were forced out. Um, and now that they're out, anything goes. And I want to give you some concretes of that because today, 3rd of September, in the Financial Review, um, Joe Longo, the new chair, their replacement, and Sarah Court, one of the commissioners, um, have done an interview. And the, the title of the interview is ASIC Enforcer Dishes Out Warning to Banks. And I'll tell you what, that is as puff piece a title as you'll ever see. It bears no relationship to what they're actually telling the banks in this interview. And I'm just going to read you segments of the interview, right? Um, however, Ms. Court said the, quote, why not litigate strategy adopted at the suggestion of Banking Royal Commissioner Kenneth Hain, quote, has had its day. It never got a day. It never got a day. <laughs> why not litigate means Hain had said to them, when you see crime, why don't you take it to court, right? Mm. Why not litigate? No. And then she added, well, I mean, of course, you do that. Ask yourself, why not litigate? And then you answer the question. And often there are many reasons why you don't litigate. Yeah, because you're, not, you're never going to take on the banks. Um, she indicated that enforceable undertakings were back in vogue after being shunned during the tenure of Mr. Crennan and James Shipton. Mr. Crennan had said they were unlikely to be provided by the regulator because they did not require an admission of liability. Quote, my own view is that an enforceable undertaking can be completely appropriate in the right circumstance. Infringement notices can be completely appropriate. What I'm about is quick, fast deterrent actions that send a message to the regulated community. Yeah, you get your shareholders to pay a few million dollar fine and we'll, leave it, we'll let it go, right? Nobody ever goes to jail. Um, here's another quote from the article. She said she wanted to, quote, mop up all Hain Royal Commission matters. By Christmas. In other words, sweep it under the carpet. Let's get this not, behind not, us. That's not mopping, Robbie. Yep. That's sweeping under the carpet. Exactly. And the final quote, Mr. Longo also declared Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, which governs the provision of financial services, a disgrace that was in desperate need of reform. He also lamented the over-criminalisation of corporate conduct and how it caught minor offences. Oh, poor didums, <laughs> right? And this sort of thing, oh, you know, oh, that shouldn't be considered criminal. That shouldn't be considered criminal. This is how 
the system is the bank the, the regulator is kept deliberately weak so it can't enforce because it can't enforce the law against the banks then it can't do its basic job to to protect say 140 elderly people in western australia sounds like we can expect some more legislation coming forward to do exactly that robbie you well watch. they can so they clear that asics clearly got the message craig but let me ask you this why is cleaning up the financial system so fundamental to making the economy work for everyone. Because the focus shouldn't be on the financial system, Robbie. It has to be on the actual economy. Yep. And what we've got is a parasitical system. We've had it for, for decades now where the intention of the government is to fund speculation and the bank's profits, which is all stuck into the property market and making these mega bucks. Now, unless we have a change of focus away from the financial system and money making and the monetarism that's gone on into the idea of funding the physical economy through the creation of real credit, then there isn't going to be a change. We also need Glass-Steagall to separate out the legitimate banking actions, the, the, the retail banking from the this, this speculative merchant and uh, you know, investment banking side of things. We've, we've had legislation in the parliament about this. Because what you're and saying is the financial system doesn't serve the economy anymore, it serves no, itself. No, it doesn't. And the point is that this is why and I guess we come back to the Chifley years where Chifley was trying to nationalise the banks because he says the role of credit has to be yep. up, uh, taken up by the government and we need a national bank, a strong bank like the Commonwealth Bank was in order to regulate credit throughout the economy. Now he was throwing, he, you know, that idea was thrown out, it was thrown out by the High Court. There was a massive operation by the private banks against him and it didn't get up. But see, that's the principle here. We need a strong government-owned bank like the Commonwealth Bank was to be able to direct credit into the economy for productive purposes and then ban speculation. And, and that's the, the change in policy that is absolutely needed. Otherwise, you know, we are going to see a further crash of the, the physical and it has to be a public economy. bank because only a public bank could create could break the monopoly of the big four. And it's the monopoly of the big four that gives them so much well, power. When we're saying public probably what we're saying is it has to have the willing backing of the government exactly. towards directing credit yep. for the people into the economy Again, for the people. Yep. But a, this, is, this is not a financial issue. This is a political issue. Just, and, and the political issue is, is the government of the day prepared to take on the private banking system in order to protect the interest of the people as a whole? And the answer is, what it's doing with ASIC, what, it's, what you've seen happening with the Royal Commission and the lack of action on that, the answer is no. We already knew that, and that's why, you know, um, Morrison as Treasurer opposed the idea of even a Royal Commission some 36 times or something because he knew that you know, he had to protect and he is, you know, continue to protect the banks. Well, you raised the real economy and that's what we're going to talk about right now. So what a real economic recovery should look like. And um, Craig, so right now, you know, there's the two biggest cities are in lockdown, et cetera, and, and the economy is all that um, uh, everyone's concerned about. Again, I want to remind people a few months ago how uh, Morrison and, and, and uh, Frydenberg were bragging about the snapback mm. of the economy. We were snapback people. And, it, you know, and on paper, the way they measure it, of course, it seemed quite impressive. Um, what did they mean? They meant um, the housing market was back, right? In fact, we saw some st statistics today as well and truly back anyway. You know, retail's back open, etc. cetera. Um, but that is not an economic recovery. And we have to change the way people think about this. The economy was already in bad shape, and we're going to give you some examples. Um, and, and today, this part of the discussion is we're going to get to the manufacturing issue and show you why it's important. But let's go, let's go to it the long way. Look at the state right now of public health care in Australia. Right now, right? So I'll give you some examples. Western Australia. There's no COVID in Western Australia. No. Its hospitals are in a terrible crisis right now. It's not being flooded with patients, with COVID patients, but it's being flooded with enough patients to overdo it um, just from normal stuff. They have this thing called ambulance ramping where the ambulances have, just have to sit there until there's a bed available. That exceeded 6,000 hours this last month in August, right? Ambulance ramping. ramping. The health minister now, was when he was in opposition um, a few years ago, and it hit 1,030 hours in one month, he called that a crisis, right? It's hit 6,000 hours in South Australia this month. Western Australia. Sorry, Western Australia this month. Um, now, the government there has said they're going to uh, open another 332 beds, but the, but the Australian Medical Association says, look, that's, that's half of what's required, right? So that's WA. 
Um, in Victoria, there's a fight with the ambulance union and the Victorian government because the union is accusing the government of using COVID as the excuse to hide the chronic, the chronic lack of resourcing for the ambulance, right? They say we should be, and we haven't, we, ha we don't have an, I mean, we might have a big numbers in a month or so, but we don't have an abu a huge numbers of COVID patients yet, um, but they're already stretched off their feet. And it's a resources question, right? This is the point. Um, in New South Wales, in the, in the, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald on the 29th of August, there's an intensive care nurse, Michelle Rosentreter, who did a, a, uh, an, an interview, um, and she, talk, she, she highlighted the shortage of nurses, and she actually called for um, the fast for, for the nurses' training to be fast tracked, right? So they can bring nurses on board because the government said, "Oh yeah, there's lots and lots of ventilators and all that kind of stuff." It's not about the it's not about the equipment; it's about the staff, right? And an extreme shortage of those. Um, uh, and then uh, the the, on the 30th of August, the Sydney Morning Herald reported. This is a few days ago. Quote, the federal government is seeking urgent advice from intensive care doctors about the pressure on hospital wards from sustained demand that will last for months. And as people point out, why, we're 18 months into this thing. Why are they only seeking that advice now, right? So this, this state of the healthcare system um, is chronic. Few other factors. Look at regional healthcare across Australia. And I'm just, I'm just. This is anecdotal now, but everyone knows it. If you live in a regional area, look what's happened to your health hospital system, your healthcare system over the decades. Um, I like quoting Senator Jared Rennick, who who mentions this in Parliament. Um, he says, when his mother grew up, when he grew up, his mother was one of three midwives in the town of Roma in Queensland. Roma now has no midwives, right? And that's that's just repeated across the board in, in regional Australia. Australia is a country, Craig, that imports doctors from developing countries. And we know mm. a doctor who moved here from South Africa a few years ago. She got, um, and South Africa is a developing country, she got approved to move here within three days. And I said to her, why was so quickly? She said, Australia needs doctors. Yeah. Right? We don't train enough doctors ourselves in Australia. These are, these are things we've done to ourselves. Um, and then in terms of hospitals... In 1980, we had 6.4 beds per thousand. Uh, in 2016, 17, the last figures we could find, we had 3.84 beds per thousand. Yeah. Right. That's how under um, that, that's the that's the lack of capacity in our hospital system that we've done to ourselves over that time. So here's I got a question that I want you to comment on, Craig. Before this recession, you had successive governments, and everyone will remember them saying this. They boasted that Australia had enjoyed 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth, right? And it was a world record. By definition, we should have been the richest country in the world. How is it possible that one of the richest economies in the world hasn't been able to sustain a proper healthcare system in that time? Well, as I said before, Robbie, we're measuring everything by the value of money, monetarism, right? It's all speculation. Yeah, we've had a huge increase in speculation. We couldn't even produce enough face masks right, coming into the pandemic because yep. we crushed the manufacturing sector so far down. There was only one person that manufactured them in Australia, Joe Carmody, which we reported on in this show. The fact of the matter is that manufacturing has been decimated since the 1970s, late 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, because we've supposed to have become the financial centre of yep. this part of the world, right? Now, that's not real wealth because what you find is when you do have a pandemic, when you have a shortage of real needs for physical needs like in the sense of healthcare, you can't build that really yeah. quickly. Yeah. I mean, you take a you might be able to build a ventilator in a week, but you need a year to train a nurse. Right? So unless you've got an idea towards providing for the physical economic well being of the nation and for the people and so forth, and you maintain that infrastructure and said said, oh we can make a quick buck here, we don't have any many problems, we'll, we'll sell off half our hospital beds, we'll shut down our hospitals, we won't have a health, you know, a real effective public health care system. Like here in Victoria, they, de they um, centralised everything and we couldn't even handle the beginning of the pandemic here in Victoria. New South Wales didn't decentralise, they still had regional public health, they were training up postgraduate medical staff and so forth to be able to provide high level uh, you know, public health advice and so forth. So they, their, their medical system is And even then different. it would, wouldn't have been so great, but it, Victoria's was so extreme. That's the problem, well. the difference yeah. with the, of the sell-off of, of, under the, the economic rationalisms of the 90s meant that we crushed our public hospital system. And now what the government's doing is saying it's going to try and use its might to say, OK, well, we've got this private sector over there. We're going to see if we can rope them in to help doing what, the, what, what has to be done in the public system.
And the public, the private, the pro, I heard a report this morning, it says when there was, this was done during the last uh, period in Victoria, those private hospitals actually were running at a loss. So they're not too keen to get involved in this because they're going to they're be directed by a government that hasn't necessarily had a fundamental uh, uh, commitment to making things you know, fundamentally work. Well, what I want people to think about is not this as a health issue, but this as an economic issue. Because, because the, the, the health system is just one example of how we measured our economy wrong. So we can say we had 28 years of uninterrupted growth. It wasn't real growth. It wasn't real. If we can't, if we're not rich enough to sustain a, a increasing the capacity of our health system, right? So that there's ICUs spread all across Australia and we're, we're able to support them. Instead, we come up with it, we let accountants decide what's economically viable and what's not. That is a measure of what, um, you know, how actually unhealthy our overall economy actually is. And a lot of it's got to do with, what happened when we got rid of manufacturing. So think of it this way. We have an, today, Craig, we have an economy that's centred in, there's four main things, right? Financial services is the single biggest sector of our economy. That's why you're banging on about speculation. Housing construction, which is just there to, it, the, 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 the money side of housing is primary, what the banks lend. Housing construction is just boosted by that. The, the other side of this, Robbie, is that, you know, the government's terrified about the hundreds, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people employed in the housing industry. So if yeah, they yeah. don't keep this bubble going from the point of view of building more expensive houses, where are those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people going to work? Because we don't have a manufacturing sector, a high quality manufacturing sector to absorb them. So that's what they're also terrified about. So the bubble about. that makes housing unaffordable just has to keep growing. And it's Otherwise, a, it's a bad infinity. You're gonna have you know, a, a tremendous economic shock from you know, hundreds of thousands of people employed in building new houses and so forth, coming into the workforce, they've got nowhere to go. So the, the, uh, the, the other sectors are international education, tourism, and resource exports. And I want to point out about those last three. That's where the, inter the, the foreign income comes from, mm -hmm. right? Those three. Um, and of course, they're all, they're all very vulnerable. We've, we've got, you know, resources are booming, thank goodness, I suppose you can say. But, but even that's, got, you've got to take that into account um, where the limitation is there. Because I want to put this chart up on the screen. This is the latest figures. Um, foreign Net foreign debt in Australia, Craig, is now over $1.2 trillion. And that has grown at the same time we've had this three decades of uninterrupted economic growth. And what that tells you is we haven't paid our way. Mm -hmm. That's the credit card we've been living on because we haven't paid our way. And t just take, just take um, uh, resources for a second. Yeah, it's great. You know, we're, we're um, pumping out iron ore. At, at record rates, right? And China keeps buying it. And are, for whatever reason, the, the most pro-resource pro, uh, politicians in Australia are the most anti-China as well. I don't get that. But anyway, we won't go there. But if we don't have manufacturing, we're actually robbing ourselves of income by pumping all that. And I want to give you a quick example. I haven't used these figures for a long time. But back in 1970, the Gorton government was looking at the Australian Industry Development Corporation which, which they wanted to set it up as a, as a public banking institution to invest in, in um, industries that could value add to our resources. So we weren't just exporting resources. And they, they use the example of bauxite. Mm. We've got the biggest bauxite mine in the world up in Weeper in, in Queensland there. Um, and these were 1970 figures, but the proportions are what's key, right? And in this submission to the cabinet at the time, 1970, uh, the submission revealed that one million tonnes of bauxite dug out of the ground at Weeper if we exported that at the time, earned Australia $5 million. But if we processed it here, one step into Illumina, and exported that, we earned $27 million. If we processed it one more step into aluminium itself, and exported that, we earned $125 million. And if we processed it into aluminium products, and exported those, we earned $600 million. So the difference between the raw material of five million and the the final product of six hundred million, that is economic real wealth that we when we're sending out raw materials we're foregoing. Yeah, Robert, right. there's, an, there's another example which is really live at the moment. This is called the iron boomerang. Yes. Now we've got a video up on the uh, on YouTube. People should click iron on, on on the link and watch it because this, this is a live you know, shovel ready project where we're taking coking coal from 
up around the Bowen area, yep. shipping it by train across to the Pilbara, taking the iron ore from the Pilbara and building 10 steel mills both ends. Five, at five on both ends to process our own product and then send first stage steel outside the country in order for further processing. Much Make more it, efficiently, because you're not instead of these great, great big bulk cargo yeah, handlers, etc. People should look at that, because this is an example of what can be done in our country. It's very optimistic. That's why it's the most popular video that we have in our suite of videos, because this is what can be done. But again, it's a political will, and the, the political will means you have to dump all the ideas of economic rationalism, com particularly comparative advantage, you know, yep. and all of these these doctrines that have polluted our uh, economic thinking for the last four or five decades, and go back to what John Gorton was talking about with this idea of trying to you know uh, manufacture or develop our own resources. We, properly. we were a manufacturing powerhouse until the 1980s. And we only had half the population, Robbie. No, of course. Until the 1980s, and then they came up with all, the, all sorts of excuses to shut it down. And so essentially what we're saying, Craig, is if we have, there is no economic recovery, snapback is not an economic recovery. There is no genuine economic recovery in Australia without being centred in a massive expansion of manufacturing, and that's what a national development bank can help with. And that's what we stand for as a party, Robbie. We're going to the next federal election on this. We need to have a national bank to already create credit. We want real large-scale infrastructure projects where the wealth is measured in what's left after you build it, not thinking about profits as some sort of balance sheet profit yep. uh, on, you know, from, from companies and so forth, but the profit. Real profit, Robbie, is what you leave behind. Real profit is a healthcare system that actually works and supports the population. Does it cost something? Yes, it does. What if, what if you don't have that? Well, it costs lives. Well, a lot, it costs a lot more. Exactly. It costs a lot more. And you think yep. about the amount of money that's been poured into this pandemic at the present time, trying to contain it and do everything. Well, you know, we didn't have... This is what happens when, you, when, when you're playing catch-up. Yeah, and there's an old saying, for want of a nail... The kingdom was lost. Yes. And if you go back, look it up. If you don't know that saying, look at Google it because they'll give you all the steps in the between. If for want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For one of the shoe, the, 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 the horse was lost. For one of the horse, the rider was lost. For one of the rider, the message was lost. For one of the message, the war was lost. For one of the war, the kingdom was lost, right? There's a That's, lot of things we can do, Robbie. There's a lot of, you know, this is not, yep. this is not the end of, you know, what we're facing at the present time is not the end of things. There's a lot of things that we can do. We need people to get involved support what we're doing, support our campaigns. Well, and in the immediate sense, Craig, we need people in the next week to make a submission to that manufacturing inquiry. Click yes. on the link, make a submission. Any citizen's qualified to do it. You're demanding the Senate in this inquiry understand that we have to go back to being a manufacturing nation. and We've got this brilliant policy of a national development bank that can provide the investment to make it work. Right, and we've we've got material on our website that we've been talking about for well over you know almost two years specifically on that question now. So, please do that. Everybody do it so that the the the, the senators who uh, conduct this inquiry don't turn it into a talk fest. They realise hey, there's real demand out there. All right. Um, so, yep. Craig, thanks very much for joining yep, us. Welcome. Uh, like you said. Citizens Party supporters and uh, members will get some notification from us soon on the Electoral Commission. If they haven't already. Re if they haven't already, re-registration re process. Make the submission and thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more of the Citizens Report.